The next question he approaches is, how does language create universals? Right? And he has this thing, he, he talks about proper names and common names. So it's a proper nouns and common nouns. Right? Um, and well, why don't I read this passage and we can think it through. Of names, some are proper and singular to one only thing, as Peter, John, this man, this tree. And some are common to many things, as man, horse, tree, every of which, though but one name, is nevertheless the name of diverse particular things, in respect of all which together it is called an universal, there being nothing in the world universal but names, for the things named are every one of them individual and singular. Right? Um, so, um, so he's saying that, well, let me, I'll just read the last sentence. One universal name is imposed on many things for their similitude in some quality or acci other accident, and whereas a proper name in, uh, bringeth to mind only uh, one thing only, universals recall any one of those many. Right? So he's saying that, that we, don't ha we don't have a way of conceiving of a universal um, without um, a common noun. Right? And so he's differentiating between the proper nouns, which just you know, w you know, uh, designate one particular thing, whatever, he's Peter, right? Um, and is anybody named Peter here? No? Nobody named Peter? Or nobody wants to say? Well, <laughs> I know Dave over there. So Dave <coughs> is one particular person. And when I say Dave, it's just that, that person. It's just that one guy. A and so it's a singular thing. That's the proper noun, right? And he's saying there's nothing special about that, <laughs> okay? Uh, every, um, every designation of a proper noun is just uh, a specific thing, just like everything in our experience is a, sp a specific thing. But he's saying that if we want to talk about a universal, um, then you need to be able to move to a common noun, uh, which would be just, you know, man, a man, right? Not the man, a man, uh, which would then be a universal. Right? And, 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 and he's really saying that we can't have the universal without the common name. Uh, and the common name is something that takes one characteristic um, and uses that as um, the measure by which in order to create a whole class of things together. Right? And so you're, you're creating a classification system when um, you, 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 you think of a common noun. Right? Um, so he's, what he says, you know, that, that phrase where he says, um, um, he's, a universal name is imposed on many things for their similitude in some quality or other accident. So, so you're taking one characteristic um, and using that as the mark for bringing all of those things into one um, category. Right? Um, so, um, but, you know, actually, I'm, I'm forget the guys, the person that asked the question before about, you know, about animals, about how, how the, the, I think we can, we, can, we can ask the same question about this thing about universals. Um, is any reduction of lots of specific things to one general thing a form of naming, right? So when we, you know, when a bird recognizes a worm, that's a worm, I'm going to go eat it. Is, does, is, the, is, the, is the bird having, does the bird have a name in order to do that? Or does the bird obviously doesn't, it doesn't have a word or a human language to do it. Um, so maybe there's, there's some way of, of, of creating that uh, sense of classificatory universals without using uh, uh, an enunciated name, right? Um, so there's, there's something in common between those two things. Obviously, when the bird is identifying the worm, the bird is actually you know, creating a class of things that's all together, you know, that's a, you know, whatever, it's defined as, as, as whatever worm in the bird's thought corresponds to worm. Uh, it is a kind of a universal. It's not using it through language, but, but language is doing the same thing. So there's, you know, on the one hand, I guess you could say this is a sort of a, uh, a way to contradict Hobbes' argument. On the other hand, though, I think we need to think of this as uh, a way of understanding just what, um, what kind of work language is doing and that language is not the only thing that does it. Um, and so we can, we, can, we can start, I mean, this is a starting point for thinking about the origin of language. Because if we can find something that happens without language and also happens in language, there's a kind of a transition there. There's a, there's a kind of opportunity for thinking through, OK, there's something that's going on in nature without language. It also happens in language. What's the bridge? That's, that, could, that could be a bridge. 
in order to create the possibility for, for a transference of something that's going on, even if language is doing something more than just that. Right? So, so I, I just want you to kind of hold on to that idea that this, this, this um, creation of universals of, by language is something that language does. It might not be the only thing that does it, but it's also because it's a point of kind of uh, correspondence between, I guess you could say, maybe nature and language, it's, it can help us to, to kind of differentiate that, that origin point. Okay? So anyway, just that, that kind of a note here as we're looking through this, this passage. Okay? Um, the next piece of the argument that he wants to get a little deeper into is the way in which um, speech uh, allows us to ter determine cause and effect. Right? So he's saying that we can't determine cause and effect without language. So by this imposition of names, he says, we turn the reckoning of the consequences of things imagined in the mind into a reckoning of the consequences of appellations, so of, of, of names. Right? Um, so really, you know, what he's saying is that by creating these different classes of universals, these words allow us to translate an idea of cause and effect between specific things into a relationship between words. Right? So you remember we had the train of things and the train of words. Um, I think the train analogy is appropriate because the, you know, he's, he's creating linkages between the thoughts, or there's linkages between thoughts where he's, and he's matching them up with, with the linkages between words, right? And then, so that you can, what he's saying here is that it allows us then to generalize cause and effect from, a sp from specific things to whole classes of things, right? So the words, again, they're classes of things, they're not specific things. And if you can only create cause and effect between specific things, you're not able to generalize that theory of cause and effect to something more than that specific case, right? And so this is really what's, what's key for him, is, is that, that process of generalization. So if, um, if, if, if what's going on with specific words is a, is a, is a, is a process of universalization, you know, you've got the, um, you've got the um, instead of a, specific thing you're referring to, we're you know, referring to Dave, we can refer to men as a general category. That's the move toward a universalization. Um, he's saying that that's enabled through words, and it is enabled through words, but maybe it's not enabled only through words, right? He's also giving us the same kind of relationship um, uh, in, in terms of the idea of cause and effect. There could be a specific cause for a specific effect, but maybe we can use language, or he's saying that, we, that language is used in order to generalize that, to generalize cause from a specific class of things to a effect in a, in a particular class of things, right? Um, so let's take a look at how this works. He gives us an example, right? And he gives us an example of the triangle, right? So if you remember, um, <coughs> he says, he that hath the use of words when he observes that such equality was consequent not to the length of the sides nor to any other particular thing in this triangle but only to this that the sides were straight and the angles three and that was all um, and that that was all for which he named it a triangle will boldly conclude universally that such equality of angles is in all triangles whatsoever and register his invention in these general terms every triangle hath its three angles equal to two right angles right <coughs> Um, and then he cites Euclid, right? So this is the other um, quote that he has, and I think um, he's using this quote uh, much more um, strictly than he's using the Bible quote, right? Um, what's important here is that we're not talking about a specific triangle, but we're talking about all triangles, um, and that relationship of, I guess, um, correspondence between the fact of being a triangle and the fact of having uh, all of the angles add up to two right angles, that's um, um, a category, a, a universal uh, conclusion about all triangles, and he wants to move from the specific triangle to the, uh, to the universal triangle, right? And I've got a diagram here. It's a little complicated, <laughs> uh, but I want to go through it because it's very important for what we're talking about. Um, so we have, on the one hand, you've got um, the specific triangle, you know, so we find a specific triangle. It's not exactly a triangle in nature, but it's a triangle, right? And it's a specific one. Um, if we wanted to determine that the three angles of the triangle added up to two right angles, we could measure it. You can go through and measure the angles and figure it out and, and then add it, and then we could figure it out like that, right? But, if, um, but he, what he's saying is that um, it's only by turning that specific triangle into an example of a general triangle 
that you can come to a general rule and by using the general rule, all of a sudden then you could, every time you see a triangle, you can, you can, you can arrive at this conclusion, right? So the, the general rule then is up here, right? Any shape with, three stri st uh, with straight sides and three angles is a triangle, so that's the first general rule, right? And that's, the, that's a definition, in a sense, right, where, where you can say, okay, for this shape has those characteristics, it's a triangle, right? The second part of it, though, for any triangle, the three angles add up to two right angles, right? So those are two, um, two general rules that, that you can only create if you have language because um, as he's indicating, the way the language is working, it's taking a specific thing and turning it into a whole category of things and it's giving a mark to that category of things, that word, which is the mark, right? And you're able to manipulate the words without having to manipulate every sp single specific thing, right? And so um, if we're able to look at that shape and say this, it's, bec it's not because we're, we're going directly and, and doing the measurement, otherwise you'd have to do that measurement with every single triangle you saw. No, we're going through this, this whole loop where we've got the general, the general rule that you can only have through words, um, to, to get to here. So it's, it's kind of a, a detour in a sense, but it's a detour that simplifies things immensely because every single triangle, um, you can look at it and make that conclusion without having to measure, right? So without having to go through the specifics uh, of that case, right? Does that make sense? All right, w w one, one moment, okay. So, um, so words allow us to make general statements about cause and effect. All right, so then finally, he's got the <coughs> example of the of the clock, right, where he says that what c you can't count unless you have names for numbers, right? So without names for numbers, every stroke of the clock would be a unique event. You just, you know, you, you, you just count one, 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 and you wouldn't be able to, to count the strokes of the clock. And, and again, he, what he's emphasizing is the way in which words allow us to register our thoughts rather than having each thought disappear with the coming of the next thought, right? So. Um, yeah, so, so, so essentially he's saying, you know, we, we, would ha we would be constantly only in the very present moment without words, right? And so words allow us then to, to link the present moment to this, this previous moment um, and set up a relationship between those two moments, right? That relationship between present moment and past moment, again, is for him another characteristic of language um, that's key that can't be done without language is what he's arguing, right? Um, so as a sort of summary um, of, of what we've got here, the marks of language serve to register thoughts, allowing us to perceive cause and effects by establishing names and the connections between them, right? So that would be kind of a, a one sentence kind of summary of what we talked about today, right? But it kind of, it, you know, as you've seen, it, uh, it includes quite a lot in that one sentence.